Okay, we'll be starting again in a few minutes. Just give some time for people to come back in. So I just pasted the uh, YouTube live stream link again, in case you want to share that with uh, uh, your colleagues. I know some people from uh, University of Toronto, they're watching the live stream. All right, I guess we can get started. So uh, welcome to the afternoon session of the Minicanon Workshop. Up next, we have a keynote by Chris Martins. And after that, we will have our uh, last paper on relational floating point arithmetic. So uh, let me introduce you to Chris Martins. So Chris is an assistant professor at North Carolina State University, where they direct the POEM lab and the research applies programming languages and logic to interactive media, particularly those which could benefit from procedural content generation, such as games, interactive fiction, and various system simulations. And we're very fortunate to have Chris presenting today on relational content generation. So uh, why don't you take it away, Chris? Thanks very much, Craig. I appreciate it. And thank you for inviting me to speak here. I'm, I'm excited to talk to everybody. Uh, let's do the screen sharing thing. All right, so um, the title of this talk is a bit of a pun. Um, uh, often this, uh, as uh, Greg mentioned in his introduction, um, one of the things that I work on is procedural content generation. Um, and sometimes, but not always, uh, that uh, that field of study is kind of situated within um, environments where people are mostly using procedural programming languages. Uh, so I, I'm calling this talk relational content generation to talk about how relational programming languages can maybe address uh, some of the issues that come up in, in that world. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and I'm actually, I want to be uh, upfront about the fact that I am not a mini Canron expert. I have used mini Canron a bit um, with heavy guidance from uh, Will Bird and um, another, you know, another person who had more experience than I did to implement some uh, ideas that I, that I had been working on previously. Um, but I am mainly going to talk about 
the sort of um, some other models of relational programming that I'm a bit more familiar with. And I'd be very interested in kind of hearing from this crowd about, you know, kind of which of these ideas might be well supported by mini camera and which of them might, uh, you know, basically, I just want to try to encourage you to kind of think about whether mini camera might support some of the things that I'm discussing here. Um, so Hello, everybody. I'm Chris. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in computer science at NC State University. My pronouns are they, them. And um, my research centers around what many people call game artificial intelligence, um, including applications in interactive narrative. And in particular, my group tries to research and build tools and small languages, usually domain-specific languages for system design and computational creativity um, in these interactive media contexts. So I, I'm also um, an aficionado of functional programming and logic programming. I you know, grew up with those things, so to speak, in, in grad school. Um, that was my focus. And um, I also just am constantly fascinated by how humans work, especially when humans are interacting Thing with computers. Uh, so, you know, to some extent, my, my research overlaps with human computer interaction. And uh, because of that, I've, I've had to learn a lot and I've enjoyed learning a lot about kind of human cognition and psychology and kind of how uh, the, the particular ways that different modes of programming or thinking or interacting with a system can get us to think about and solve problems differently. Um, so, this idea of procedural content generation um, goes back, at least in terms of the origin of the term, to uh, the sort of early days of video games in the 1980s. Um, originally, it was kind of used as a mechanism for say, for creating a smaller memory footprint of your game. So rather than basically the idea is that rather than wanting to um, manually encode everything about your game world, everything, every individual room and asset and piece of uh, decoration and terrain and um, planets you might visit if you're in a space simulator or something. Like rather than trying to hand author all of that content, you set up some basic rules for what types of content can exist and you implement an algorithm to generate that content for you. Um, this is a uh, yeah, is a strategy that that was used to kind of reduce a memory footprint for older games that couldn't use a lot of memory, um, but could you know lean more on processing power to generate those kinds of things on the fly. Um, it is still used today in strategy games, um, uh, like uh, Hoplite and Polytopia are a couple of examples that I've played on my phone recently that are like strategy games with procedurally generated maps. Um, people generate sort of interiors of spaces uh, that you can navigate and uh, levels for games in the class of games known as roguelikes um, based on the 1970s game Rogue, uh, which are games where you are tra traversing a series of dungeons, but whenever you die, you have to start at the beginning. Um, so you need variation in order to make that a tolerable play experience. Um, and then, you know, and then all the way from games like, you know, that are strictly text-based or, or ASCII-based and, you know, to like full um, high-budget AAA style games like No Man's Sky. Um, this, this idea has really kind of been permeating the world of games or at least the kind of like vision that, that people have for what a, a good game can be um, for, for its entire, the entire history of digital games. Um, it's, it's also not necessarily just about digital games. Um, there's, uh, so, so this is the, on the left, there's the Spore cre uh, Creature Creator from, from the EA game Spore, um, which is a game, uh, but, but it's, uh, you know, the, the kind of, the, the procedural content generation or an element of procedural content generation that showed up in Spore was the Creature Creator, which was more like a tool that um, players could interact with to design the next evolution of their creatures as they kind of go through the stages of, of evolution. Um, to and then you know kind of based on the the way that they sculpt that creature it moves around in the world differently it might have a higher or, or lower chance of of survival in the environment that it's placed in 
Um, similarly, in the arts, um, people have been using very similar techniques to those found in procedural content generation to do things like generating furniture or rug patterns um, or jewelry. Um, sometimes just for the novelty of it and people will you know will sell these items or will show them at exhibits uh, but sometimes for very practical purposes like you may need some you know kind of modular design for your architecture in order to get uh, a, a 3d model that's going to work in a variety of different contexts uh, there's a whole game jam or i guess maybe software jam sort of dedicated to this idea that dozens of people participate in every time it happens um, called Proc Jam. And I love the, the tagline for this, uh, make something that makes something. Um, because that's kind of, I would say, like the underlying ethos of a lot of procedural content generation work is like that, you know, each PCG project is kind of building an engine that can generate a possibility space of content. And you get a huge amount of variety from things like this. You get people generating pixelated, brutalist architecture to, um, hilarious fantasy names to abstract silhouettes of landscapes um, to psychedelically colored kaleidoscopes to 3D models of pieces of fruit, um, right? And and so you, you end up seeing just a lot of creativity emerge from this space uh, that really wouldn't be possible with without the help of algorithms. So why do people do this? Uh, we mentioned in the beginning that one of the original reasons was to reduce the memory footprint of games, but since the origin of Rogue and the sort of roguelike genre, um, there's also been a lot of emphasis on this idea of replayability, that you should, the, like a player should be able to have more experiences with the same mechanics of the game, but not have to play through the same environments or the same levels each time. Because if they did that, they might, you know, it, it would be a different kind of game because you'd be able to memorize the layout and the sort of specific sequence of actions that you could take rather than um, learning more general strategies that can apply in, in any generated environment. Um, the, uh, the same idea can kind of extend to not just replayability, which is kind of infinite uh, time playing the game, but also infinite space. Like in No Man's Sky, I think one of their kind of ways of phrasing this was that like space is infinite, so you can explore out in any direction and find a procedurally generated planet and you know it will be like fully inhabited with uh, fauna and flora and terrain and all of this stuff. Um, to some extent, procedural content generation is also done to save manual authoring effort. Um, you certainly don't need as much hand authored content um, when you have a procedural algorithm for generating it. But um, that said, that's sometimes a bit of a trap because once you start implementing a procedural generation algorithm, that can take more time than it might have taken you to author the equivalent amount of content by hand. Uh, but if you're doing, you know, if you're generating infinite content, obviously that's uh, that's not the case. Um, and then finally, one of the most important reasons that people embrace PCG to me is augmenting human creativity. The idea that algorithms um, are, you know, fundamentally like even if we're implementing the algorithms, like they are going to produce content in a way that doesn't exactly resemble or mimic the way that we would do it if we were trying to come up with ideas on our own, whether that's through randomness or through, you know, sort of recombination of the way that the algorithm works. Um, and this idea of augmenting human creativity also makes PCG really nice to fit in with this idea of mixed initiative systems, uh, which is a lot of where the work in my lab is, is focused, is on kind of creating these tools uh, that people can use to create things, but the tool itself, you know, is also doing some of that creative work and uh, operates more as a creative partner with the human creator. So there might be some elements of your map that you want to design by hand, but other parts of it that either you're not sure about, or you at least want to get some, some kind of computational feedback about what this design is going to result in, in terms of player experience. Um, and mixed initiative tools are things that can kind of show you your, your current design and give you some analysis of um, metrics that you care about for that design and also propose possible alternatives. Um, this is a screenshot of the um, sentient sketchbook uh, 
tool for designing StarCraft-like uh, strategy map games. So the, um, uh, so the question here is, uh, that kind of frames much of the, the work I'm going to talk about is how can relational programming augment creative practitioners' ability to define and navigate possibility spaces, which is what I argue anybody who's building a procedural generation system is doing. They're defining and uh, they're, they're trying to define and navigate a possibility space of content. Um, so yeah, so, so to, to talk about that, I need to get into a little bit more about what PCG is all about and what the goals are. So um, some of my, my colleagues in this space wrote a free book online uh, called The PCG Book. And in the introduction to that book, they define a few desirable properties of generators. Um, and of course, what you want out of your generator will depend on the uh, context and the situation you're going to use it in. But some of the things you might want are speed, reliability, controllability, expressivity and diversity, and creativity and believability. Um, speed is fairly self-explanatory. If your generator is running in real time, um, if it's something where the actions of the player are going to feed into or determine somehow the results of the generator, then you need to be able to generate on the fly and not uh, cause the player to wait for a long time. Um, reliability basically means can you always depend on the generator producing valid content, content that's playable, um, or you know, an unreliable generator might produce a lot of things that are basically garbage, but if you're doing that offline and you have the ability to curate or hand select um, examples, then you may not need as reliable of a, gener a generator. Um, controllability kind of refers to how much dependency do you want there to be on the input space. So do you need to be able to specify, you know, uh, parameters that are going to change the possibility space? Do you need to be able to take a stream of player actions and feed that into your generator? Or is it something more generic where uh, whatever, you know, it's just a, a, a level that's generated randomly each time? Um, Expressivity and diversity kind of refers to how many things are there in your gener generative space and how different from each other are they. Uh, this was actually kind of a common criticism of No Man's Sky is that even though it's supposedly like every planet is fully populated and procedurally generated, um, they were kind of all like, they all had the same feel to them and they all had a, you know, sort of a character that was difficult to tell like, okay, well, these things are different from the last planet, but why does that matter? Or what's the you know, kind of, what's the content? What, what's the, what's the actual meaning of this variation? How does it affect my experience? Um, and then finally, creativity and believability uh, is about, you know, kind of whether, whether the content that's produced is sort of satisfying from the perspective of whoever the intended audience is, whether it seems to be a creative work of art or a believable line of dialogue from a virtual character, for example. Um, PCG strategies are, are many. Um, some of them include directed ram randomness, recombination, generate and test, and search. Um, directed randomness is the kind of thing that you see in analog um, procedural generation as well. So before we had computers, there were artists who were using algorithms and, you know, kind of like roll, like rolling dice and um, using other forms of, of randomness to kind of dictate and following rules to, to dictate like the lines that they would draw on a page and kind of they would execute the algorithm, uh, but they were still creating art algorithmically. This is an example from Kenneth Martin um, called Chance of Order from 1951. Um, and then there are also things like uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, which is a tabletop game that you don't usually play with a computer. Um, there were these sets of uh, so-called dungeon geomorphs or tiles that you could use to kind of arbitrarily place them next to each other uh, in, a, in a tile grid and create an arbitrary dungeon. Um, so those are examples of, of directed randomness and recombination. 
Um, sometimes the techniques of directed randomness and recombination are referred to as additive because they're ways of sort of strictly populating the generative space of, of uh, you know, you define a set of rules and that says, here are the things, you know, if you think about induction as being, you know, I can talk to math geeks uh, here so I can say, like, if you think about an induction as being a... Um, uh, least upper bound on kind of extrapolating a set of rules, um, you can also think of additive procedural content generation this way in that you're defining a set of rules and then it's kind of taking the, the limit of that and populating a possibility space with all of those things. Um, things like generate and, and test and search are more uh, are sometimes referred to as subtractive because these are ways of saying, uh, saying what you don't want in the generative space. They're ways of saying, um, you know, I have an evaluation function or I have a way of testing for validity of this content and I will rule it out under certain circumstances. Um, you know, and then search, like going through a search space and saying like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go down certain branches. I'm gonna prune my search space is, is also kind of subtractive in that sense. Um, so one of the most commonly cited ways of doing um, uh, additive procedural content generation in a way that's nonetheless, I, th I think, fairly um, declarative in nature is basically using variants of context-free grammars. Um, so th these are these are several examples of how you can use context-free grammars to do generation. Um, in the upper right, you have uh, an example of an L system or a Lindenmayer system, which actually originated in biology and was motivated by, was inspired by the way that leaves um, place their leaf growth. Um, and so you basically define uh, an amount of length for each segment and a, an angle to turn. And then you write, you, 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 uh, write a, a production grammar for little turtle programs, basically logo programs that like say, okay, you know, go forward and then turn left by whatever the angle is and then um, draw a line and then turn right and then draw a line. Um, it uses the, uh, the, the square brackets to um, as push and pop symbols as well. So you can, you can do a little bit of um, it, it also, I guess it's not technically as, well as a CFG that generates this, but then it also can like save its space as it's executing. Um, so, uh, so Lindenmayer systems are notably used to generate like things that look like vegetation or trees. And this is implemented in the tool speed tree, which is um, an industrially used engine for terrain generation in games. Um, other examples include grammars that can generate the layout of maps or uh, dungeon levels in a game, or um, even like concrete, more, a little bit more concretely, things like shape grammars, uh, where you can describe how an initial shape, um, you can provide production rules basically that turn an initial shape into something more, you know, complex that's composed of self-similar things, and then those can recursively unfold to uh, to create these sort of two-dimensional or three-dimensional structures. Uh, the, the the lower right uh, screenshot is is a game called Unexplored, which is a uh, which was made by someone who's published papers on basically using these like uh, level dungeon level layout uh, grammars in a commercial game setting. Um, evolutionary algorithms are are well, I think for a long time we're kind of like one of the the dominant methods of procedural content generation. Um, and again, not just in games. Uh, and there was a, there was an interesting project that was active for a while um, called Pick Reader, which basically took these like essentially random noise uh, images and put them on a web page for people to vote for. So evolutionary algorithms are kind of a simulation of something that is a little bit like biological evolution in the sense that you call a population down to those that are closest to whatever it is you're looking for, which is defined by an evaluation function. Uh, and then you sort of, it, it introduces an element of randomness into the search, usually through uh, something kind of like mutation. And then whatever the, the top, you know, and members of the population are, you um, like you do crossover and mutation, generate new members of that set. Um, and keep going basically until you find things that uh, pass the threshold of the uh, of the evaluation function. And they did this with basically using humans as the evaluation function. So humans would sort of select the images that looked closest to uh, particular tags that they were interested in. 
and um, and they would gradually sort of evolve these random shapes into things that look more like real life objects. Um, in the games world, there's a there's a really cool project from Cameron Brown. Um, also interesting to PL people, I think, because he defines a domain-specific description language called Ludi uh, for describing board games, um, sort of two-player competitive board games. And he uses an evolutionary algorithm to, uh, to generate them, to generate sets of rules uh, for new, interesting board games um, that are going to be fun to play according to various metrics that he defined computationally. Um, and so he has this nice diagram of kind of how this algorithm works in that uh, you start out with a population, select parents and crossbreed, uh, crossover and mutate. Um, and then there's like this series of checks, right? Where like, because evolutionary algorithms don't tend to like necessarily obey things like syntax, um, especially if you have like some weird crossover function that's going to do something unusual to the syntax, then like you might wind up with something that's not well formed. So if you do that, you have to throw it away. Um, if it is well formed, it may just be that it is too slow, it's not performant, or it just has some other characteristic that you can easily check uh, that, that doesn't, you know, make any sense. Like if this were a, a program, right, it might be like, it does it, does it type check, right? And so you have to go through all of these, um, these checks uh, and, and throw things out if they're not good enough. And then if they are, then they, they still, they survive into the next round of the population for generation. Um, but all of this is basically just a way of defining and navigating a search space, right? This is, you're kind of saying um, there's a there's a set of allowable things, in this case, you know, board games of a particular size. Um, there's the set of all of those possible things that might exist. And then there's the set of things that, um, that actually conform to some properties that I'm looking for, uh, much like in, in program synthesis. Um, in, so yeah, so there's kind of these two perspectives. Um, I would say that there's there's kind of a, a tradition that comes more out of the arts in terms of um, if you just want to kind of describe an algorithm for making a thing, often those are described very imperatively. If you take a look at the um, there's a there's a popular tool called processing for making generative art. Uh, that a lot of artists use because it, I mean it's a dialect of Java, but it's like nicely documented and there's um, a nice user community around it, and so it, it gets a lot of adoption. And um, and you know, but essentially, rather than defining like a data structure that defines the artifact you're trying to generate, um, you you never explicitly write that down, right? You just write like a series of instructions to kind of explain. And sometimes there's randomness, but like to explain kind of step by step what the algorithm should do in order to draw something to the screen. Um, and I and I think that's in contrast to a sort of more uh, in. The tradition that's more rooted in games and that's um, kind of these days more centered in the search-based approach that feels a little bit more declarative, where you're de describing a possibility space and then essentially sampling from it. Um, and this is where answer set programming comes in, which is the flavor of relational programming um, that I'm mostly going to talk about. So um, answer set programming is um, a, a way of doing logic programming where Rather than defining a bunch of facts and also providing a query that then gives you a set, an answer or a set of answers, um, it doesn't. It doesn't give you so like in in mini Karen or in in Prolog or something, right? Like an answer takes the form of a, a mapping from logic variables to ground terms, right? You're you're generating. Um, Unif like basically unification sets. Uh, in answer set programming, what you're doing instead is generating sets of so-called stable models. And I'll get into more about what that means. Uh, I'm gonna motivate it with an example, which is loosely based on biome generation, which is something that like I just kind of got fascinated by for a bit. Um, and it makes a fun example in answer set programming, um, where like if you're trying to generate a you know fictional world from scratch and you wanna define sort of what the uh, what the life, uh, what types of life grow there, like what types of uh, vegetation and maybe what types of animals are there, then like first you kind of have to figure out what what sort of terrain you've got and like how hot and cold it is and how uh, dry and wet it is. Um, and so this is a, a, an area that's kind of rife with like interesting sets of constraints and uh, possibilities. So, so it makes a nice uh, demo for procedural generation. 
Um, and you're not meant to understand the code on these slides yet, but this is just to kind of show you at like a zoomed out level, like what an in, what the input and output is of doing answer set programming. So when you when you write a logic program, um, you know you basically create you know, create a, a thing that looks like if you blur your eyes, like basically just like an ordinary logic program and then um, produces for you a set of answers. So you never explicitly issue a query. You um, uh, you uh, just have your program and then you say you, you ask for a certain number of answers and it gives you a set of predicates of ground predicates uh, that are essentially consistent with the input program. Um, so we'll build up to that example kind of from, from first principles, um, starting out with just sort of a quick primer on how this stable model thing works. So um, I guess something to understand right off the bat, if this helps you at all, is that answer set programming uh, can be implemented with SAT solvers. And in fact, like I think the most co common implementation, Klingo, uh, is actually built on a satisfiability solver. Um, so that's like the, the same set of things you could do with, for example, like Z3 or any other SAT solver or there's, are the sorts of problems you can solve with answer set programming. Um, but the, the way you write it is, you know, closer to traditional logic programming. So uh, so if you write down a couple of facts, right, um, like there's an ocean, there's a forest, um, there's just going to be one answer. Uh, that's the set of state, you know, the, the set of stable models is one stable model in which there is an ocean and there is a forest. Um, the syntax of curly braces does what's called a choice rule, where you basically say, uh, this thing might be a fact. You can decide whether or not to make it true, um, as long as it's consistent with, as long as that choice is consistent with everything else in the program. So if you say curly braces ocean and curly braces forest, then suddenly there are four answers because now there are four stable models that satisfy this program. Uh, one of them is the empty model in which neither of those things happens to be true. Uh, one of them is the one in which only ocean is true, only forest is true, and then the, finally the one where both of them are true. Um, so you can set up implications. You can say uh, choice, you know, curly braces ocean, and then you can say ocean implies forest. And if anybody wants to quickly type in the chat your guess for how many answers there are, uh, if you didn't peek ahead in the slides already, um, go ahead and type that in. Okay, good. I see. I see a range of answers. That's that's actually good to see. I think that's. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to sort of think through how many, you know, how many things you might expect. Some people are saying three, some are saying two, someone said one. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, so the answer is two, right? There, um, the whether or not there's an ocean is kind of our one choice, right? So we have, we have just sort of a, a single branch in our decision tree and uh, we can either make an ocean or not. Uh, and if we do make an ocean, then it will necessarily imply a forest. Uh, forest will have to exist in order to make this a stable model. Um, now we could put forest in curly braces, and then you know even if an ocean exists, we now have a different choice of whether to to create forest. Um, so that would be a different program there. So in the, for this one, there are two. Um, there's also this idea called an integrity constraint, um, which is essentially you can think of this is called a, a, a headless rule. Sometimes I like to teach answer set programming on Halloween uh, for the puns uh, because we can talk about headless rules. And so this is, you know, this is a rule where the neck doesn't have anything to the left of it. So it looks very strange. Um, you can think of it as sort of being implies false, right? Rather than uh, rather than implies like something that we would expect over here, it implies nothing. So it's like these two things together are a contradiction. Um, so if you say you have a choice to make it, you can you can make it wet if you want to, you can make it dry if you want to, but you cannot make it both wet and dry. Um, and then in that case, there would be three possible answers. Uh, you've now sort of set up this mutual exclusion between them. Um, and, you know, and then you can build on that. So you can say, all right, uh, you can make it wet or dry. You can't make it both. Um, if it's wet, then there's an ocean. And if it's dry, then there's a forest. And that kind of gets you the same, essentially the same three answers we had before, but um, you know, augmented with this additional rule uh, or this additional fact of, of either wet or dry, whichever the, the condition was that led to 
the terrain. Um, and so a, a natural extension of the choice rule syntax is this idea of having um, uh, putting a, a minimum and a maximum. So the number one over to the left is a minimum number and the number one over to the right um, is a maximum number. So here I'm saying there should be exactly one fact of the following form. And so I can start putting in my logic variables and saying, all right, I want there to be a tile in a given area and it's going to have the, um, the, the value property t, property t tile um, so long as the capital T tile is a type of terrain. So this is ba basically saying assign a terrain to an area and then do that for each area. Um, so that's what the, uh, the the implication on the outside says. Okay, the syntax is a little bit um, complex and I'm not going to fully explain it. Uh, it is possible to kind of elaborate this out to just the style of choice rules that we saw before. And in fact, um, what Klingo does um, as its way of solving answer set programs is it first totally grounds a program. So you have to, it's another interesting constraint is like you have to make sure your program is, is finite in terms of the number of facts that are implied from what, whatever you start with. Um, so um, yeah, so, and so this can all like, uh, this is all kind of like syntactic sugar that can elaborate out to that more basic form of choice rule, but essentially you have one, um, uh, one fact of this form for each of the thing, you know, for each thing that for which this predicate applies. Um, you can set up integrity constraints to do things like stipulate that perhaps uh, mountains and oceans can't be neighbors. Maybe you only want to generate examples where there's a more gradual uh, sort of variation in the uh, elevation of the terrain. And so you don't want sort of mountains and sea level to be right next to each other. Um, so you can say, uh, if there are two tiles, one of them has a mountain, one of them has the ocean, then they, they cannot be neighbors. Um, and you can write that with an integrity constraint this way. Um, and then you can uh, you can also add hard-coded parts of the map yourself. So if you want to say, like, the entire top row of my map is ocean, then you can write a, a regular kind of logic programming rule to say um, the tile at each of these positions, 0, comma n for any n in our y range, should be ocean. Um, so this gives you kind of a nice way of both like of combining this kind of design of stipulating what is in the map with rules that can kind of fill in the gaps according to constraints. Um, so this is typically your workflow, right? You you author your ASP program, um, you send it out to the solver, which generates a bunch of examples. Um, if you're in some kind of if you're uh, trying to generate some kind of visual domain like maps, you probably have you know you probably need some tool to visualize it for you or something, and then you need to sift through that set of examples, and we'll get into that a bit later. Uh, but essentially, then you you have a set of examples that you can evaluate, and if you find things that you're like, oh, I actually didn't want maps where like. 90% of it was ocean and there was only one land tile, then you can start to refine your idea of what even the specification is that you're trying to uh, to generate. And you go back into your program and like stipulate a new constraint. Like you might say, oh, okay, um, I want I want it to be the case that like at least uh, this many of my tiles are going to be land tiles. Um, the tools that are available for this kind of thing include Patasco Klingo, which I've been referencing a bit already. Um, it's open source uh, and fairly well maintained. Um, and then more recently, one of my colleagues, Ian Horswell, has developed a tool called Catstat, which has native Unity integration and a bit better support for randomness. Um, that's another interesting thing is like when you ask for a certain number of answers, you can tell search to... to uh, you can you can ask it to do search in a in a random way, um, but there's not very much control over what that means and what the sample space is that you will get when you ask for a certain number of answers. So CatSat is an implementation that's kind of a little bit more tuned to random sampling and uh, has fairly decent performance for the um, applications of ASP that are common in procedural content generation. So why is this particular tool good for PCG? Uh, well, let's like revisit some of the properties that we talked about. Um, I will start off just by saying 
the like speed is not a property that I would say uh, answer set programming particularly does well at. And that's mostly because answer set programming is a general purpose tool. It's like general purpose SAT solving. And so while yes, we do have reasonably well optimized SAT solvers, um, there's always going to be ways that you can write programs and domains that will essentially have exponential blow up um, depending on like the size of the level. Um, and it's not, it, it, it's, I, I have found in my experience teaching ASP and having people use it, having students use it in projects um, that it there is, it, while it's possible to optimize ASP programs in terms of clause ordering and so on, and um, the way that you write your predicates to like uh, speed up, um, it is very easy to just naively write your program in such a way that you get exponential slowdown um, that is prohibitive to use in online PCG applications. Um, so that's something that I think is worth like considering. Um, I'll revisit that a bit. Uh, so, but otherwise, I think it does pretty well, right? It, it's got a good, uh, um, certainly better reliability than um, most evolutionary algorithm approaches, wherein you can really only specify what you want um, kind of indirectly through these evaluation functions, and then hoping that the sort of randomness of the mutation and crossover will get you in a portion of the search space that you're interested in. Um, whereas in ASP, you can just directly say, like, nope, this part of the search space is not valid. Um, you can have um, you have pretty decent control controllability because of the fact that you can just straight up add hard coded facts. Um, you have pretty good expressivity and diversity through the use of choice rules and just the fact that it's a logic programming language. You can define whatever terms you want, um, and of course, creativity and believability. I mean, certainly it's it's possible to do that or to not do that. Um, it's fairly domain specific whether or not a given you know that's kind of like the job of the implementer. I would say. Um, in this case. Um, in terms of ASP and creativity, I do think that it has two kind of uh, nice, like emergent properties that are good for facilitating this kind of thing. Um, one that I'll refer to as the sculptural approach to design space creation, and one that I'll refer to as bidirectionality. Um, so by sculptural approach, what I mean is that often an answer set program kind of consists of three sections. Um, one part where you generate content, with usually with a bunch of choice rules. Um, one where you do sort of some standard logic programming to define whatever properties you want. Uh, and then another where you add integrity constraints to kind of um, chisel away at the space. And I'm using that, that um, kind of metaphor deliberately to, to fit in with the sort of sculptural approach idea. Um, so kind of to go back to our earlier terminology, um, generating with choice rules is a bit like the additive part of procedural content generation and constraining things with integrity constraints gradually sort of carves away bits of that search space and is more like the subtractive uh, aspect of uh, content generation. Um, there are two projects from my lab that use answer set programming heavily. Uh, one of them is a game generator that we made called Gemini. Um, it's, it generates games um, not like, so uh, in Cameron Brown's work, he was generating um, board games meant to be played kind of between two humans. Uh, in our case, we were generating single player kind of arcade style mini games um, that were designed to fit within the context of an interactive narrative experience. So there would be some sort of story content on the left side of the screen and some sort of abstract mini game on the right hand side of the screen. And the mini game was supposed to in some way reflect the narrative, which was also being procedurally generated by a different system. Um, and so with our, uh, so we, we, we implemented a, a, a game generator for that using answer set programming. Um, and more recently I've been um, looking for a title for this uh, narrative generation engine. My student Shinmaya and I have been working on uh, where we're essentially trying to um, study problems in internet privacy related to user comprehension and developer comprehension and uh, find and there, we found that there are a lot of situations where uh, people want kind of narrative explanations of privacy policies or example scenarios that they might have to consider. And we're using answer set programming and, uh, to implement a narrative generation algorithm and do that in a way that can kind of be interacted with and explored. Um, and I have some 
funding from the NSF uh, to do that. So um, where bidirectionality shows up, uh, and one example in the Gemini project, um, is that we essentially implement a theory of grounded meaning in games um, known as proceduralist readings, uh, which which is um, you know kind of a like a it's 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 similar to how you know if you if you recall like in your literature class or something like you would read a poem and then you'd be asked to interpret the poem right like like tell 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 you what the poem means right the idea is we can kind of do the same thing for games. Um, and we can do that even for abstract games by understanding what the goals of the player are and how the mechanics of the game interact with those goals and thus what is likely to be an average or like a sort of typical experience that a player might have when um, trying to reach a certain goal under a set of constraints. And uh, this theory of proceduralist readings was previously published and developed by uh, Ian Bogos and Mike Trainer, and um, and we kind of encoded that whole theory as a logic program. And the idea is that once we encode the theory, we can both use it as a tool for analysis, where we can hard code some rules for a game and then ask it to generate sort of theories or interpretations of that game in terms of its um, potential meaning. Uh, or we can give it a set of target meanings, a set of target um, sort of aesthetics or themes that we want to come out through gameplay and then ask it to generate game mechanics that match those target meanings. Um, so the sort of one direction of this bidirectionality is synthesis in the same sense as, as program synthesis, right? Like you take a set of um, constraints and then you are generating examples that meet the constraints. And then the other direction is analysis where you provide some examples and then it tells you potentially some properties or some uh, metrics or some feedback about those examples. Um, I think that like I, I'm really interested in potentially this being connected to Amina Torlak's um, concept of solver-aided programming, uh, wherein you know, the, like essentially, like in in that situation, you're primarily really interested in analysis uh, and in safety properties of of your programs. But there's kind of no reason this couldn't also be um, more like uh, you can also be checking for like other other sorts of properties um, in a procedural content generation setting. Um, other examples that are perhaps more familiar to this crowd include um, you can use a, a context-free grammar, both for parsing programs, let's say, um, or expressions, and for generating things. You can use a context-free grammar to you know, generate text or to generate programs. Uh, you can use typing rules that are you know, like inference rules, which are essentially you know, can be written as logic programming rules and clauses. Uh, you can use them for type checking, or you can use them to do program synthesis if you have a, a sort of type-driven program synthesis engine. Um, and in the in the career project, we have um, a tool, we have this kind of theory of relating how, uh, sorry, of like, of how um, plausible user stories relate to privacy policies. And we can either sort of generate plausible user stories from that, or we can do something like uh, hand um, in code or automatically translate um, an action log from someone's interaction with a system and then kind of audit that for compliance with the privacy policy. Um, and then a final kind of aspect of uh, PCG, or sorry, of, of answer set programming for PCG um, that I care about a lot is usability. And um, this is the kind of thing where you know, if you, if you hang out in, in in games research crowds, like they're they're very interdisciplinary, which is a thing that I like about them. Um, but you'll often encounter people who don't have formal training in computer science and who don't, you know, are, who are not going to be able to sit down with a completely new model of programming if like, you know, if they learn something like processing, which is just a small dot, like a, a sort of subset with some uh, libraries for drawing, and then you sit them down with an answer set program um, it's not going to make any sense, right? And so there's often like you 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 come up against these usability hurdles a lot when you're trying to address or sort of like appeal to creative, uh, you know, audiences of creative practitioners. And I think this is really important. Um, and I I try to in, in my work I've been really inspired by Kate Compton's work on um, who. She defined this term casual creators to refer to tools that are kind of intrinsically pleasurable to use and that people use them to create 
things. Like there's an artifact they create with them, but it's kind of like they do that more because it's fun to use it than because um, they're interested in becoming a professional maker of that type of artifact, right? Um, so they're engaging with a tool like this casually in the same sense that a casual gamer might engage with a casual game um, like while they're waiting in line or you know, as a way to kind of fill gaps in, in their schedule rather than as something that they're going to sit down and deliberately do and try to invest a ton of learning and time to getting better at. Um, so some of the principles that emerge from this casual creator work after Kate surveyed a, a bunch of existing examples that um, sort of she considered within the space um, are instant feedback, uh, the kind of idea of, you know, not having to wait for a full compile cycle um, in order to see how the change you made made an effect on the output. Um, no blank canvas. So the idea of like, there's always something on the screen prompting you about something you could do rather than just a blank screen where you don't know how to start. Um, limiting actions to encourage exploration or the idea that uh, restraint breeds creativity, that if you kind of say, okay, no, you only have like three choices for the types of creative decisions you can make here, um, then that's going to kind of, while it makes it a smaller possibility space, it's at least going to make it a, a more navigable one. Um, the chorus line, which is the idea of showing lots of examples of possible things you can make um, kind of on the screen at one time. Um, and then saving and sharing and I think relatedly hosted communities. So this, uh, this idea that like if you let people share what they did with someone else and also if it's like if the sharing, if the format of sharing it is itself editable so people can kind of fork off of each other's work. Um, and do that. I mean, yeah, of course, we know that this is great in like open source and on, on GitHub, but for non programmers, it turns out this is great too, like for just creating things um, that you want to share with the, with the world. And, you know, whether or not that's code, like um, it's still really nice to be able to see previous examples and build off of other people's work. Um, and then, like, um, aspects of the community that encourage like modding and hacking um, existing examples, as well as good teaching materials um, also go a long way for casual creators. Um, so we've tried doing a bit of this work. I, I think it's, it's a bit of a challenge and maybe even a mistake for like academia to try to be responsible for you know, all of these different properties. I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily um, achievable, but um, I think that there are some of these principles that we can adopt in what we build uh, if we care about usability and, and inclusivity. Um, and that includes the idea of a structure editor, right? Um, which appeals to the no blank canvas idea that uh, rather than having just a blank text editor where you can write a program and you have to go and like read a bunch of documentation to understand what the syntax even is, um, you have some like widgets or affordances, uh, like a big plus sign that when you click it, it gives you a menu of options um, and then you can uh, piece together your program this way um, with, with some more prompts and scaffolding around what you're doing. Uh, so after we built Gemini, some uh, later students at UC Santa Cruz, including Max Kraminski, um, started building this uh, tool called Germinate, which is a structure editor for creating design Hi, Chris. Are you there? You, uh, I think you fell offline about a minute ago. Oh, okay. Or um, just under a minute ago. Any idea what the last thing you heard me say was? You were talking about Germany. And, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll start. I'll, I'll go back to the slide then. Yeah. So, so uh, Germinate is a is designed to embody some of the casual creator uh, principles. Through oh, you're, I think you need to reshare your screen. Oh. Thank you. Okay, everything look good? Can I get a verbal yes? Okay, yes, I see I see the thumbs up. Yes, good, thank you. All right, sorry about that. All right, so, um, right, so 
uh, casual creators for answer set programming. Um, this is one that we built for the, the Gemini system um, uh, to, you know, basically to, to enable people to specify, to write down these specifications for their design intentions uh, for games that they could generate. And then when they click the big generate games button, they see a bunch of playable examples and they can go back and, you know, tune their uh, specification if they don't like them. Um, along similar lines, we've recently been working on a tool for uh, tile map editing based on similar principles, again, with a uh, web-based widget sort of um, structure editor for uh, creating these expressions that represent rules and constraints in the answer set program. So you might want to say that like there are at most four roads within uh, within e within one space of each other, so that you you know kind of kind of create um, roads that look a little bit more like roads and less like big blobs of gray space. Um, you can also uh, you can see these lock symbols on the map, which indicate that you can sort of lock in certain parts of the map that you like, and then let it generate the rest of it. Uh, and we're kind of working on like trying to figure out what the um, most important like set of features would be for someone who wanted to use this in a uh, real PCG application. Um, and that finally brings me to this idea of navigating possibility spaces, which I think is one of the biggest um, kind of open problems. I, there are people who, who started addressing it, but I think it's still one of the things that needs the most kind of research attention at the moment in terms of mixed initiative PCG tools. Um, so the, the question is sort of once you've defined a possibility space, how do you know what's in it? Um, how do you navigate it? I mean, this is the kind of thing that also, of course, shows up anytime you're thinking about like a neural network or a, any machine learning algorithm that's being fed a bunch of data for training, right? Like if you don't systematically go through and read your data set, like you don't necessarily know what's in there and you don't know what the possibility space of what this thing can produce really is. Um, people have gotten in trouble because of that uh, CF, you know, Microsoft Tay, right? So you may you maybe want, and this, this refers a bit to the sort of controllability aspect of PCG, um, wanting to be able to have a better sense for what things are possible to generate and also just like what the distribution is. Is it is it going to be the case that most of your content has a certain uh, character to it. Um, and while it's possible to generate content without that character, it's unlikely, right? Um, relational programs, as you know, tend to have more than one answer. That's great. That's what makes this whole thing possible. But um, in what order do they show up when you ask for them? Uh, in what order does the solver find them? Can you easily reason about the semantics of a program in terms of what order solutions are likely to show up in? Um, can you control that in any way? Can you say, you know, I want to like ignore this whole branch for now? And, uh, you know, it, you can obviously do that by like adding new rules, but, you know, can you, can you do this in some way that is going to be a little bit more granular uh, without necessarily modifying your whole program? Um, and is it possible to even get like kind of a bird's eye view, like sense of the overall character of that possibility space? Um, my colleague, Mike Cook, describes this as, uh, the, the kind of distinction between a possibility space and a generative space where, you know, the possibility space is like the, if, if any of you are familiar with Borges' Library of Babel, right, like any possible book you can write is going to be in that library, but really you're only interested in books that at least have well-formed sentences, if not probably like plots and characters. Um, so, or, you know, like paragraphs or, or some kind of authoring intentionality behind them. Uh, so there's a possibility space, which is just the basic representation of all the things that could exist. And then there's the generative space, which is the things that your constraints or evaluation functions or whatnot um, actually limit your generative space to. And how do you get a sense for what that looks like? Right. Um, and so one way of doing this is through something called expressive range, uh, which was introduced by Jillian Smith in 2010 in the context of a platformer uh, level generator, where the basic idea is you define a set of output metrics. Um, in this example, it was the linearity of the level and the difficulty of the level. 
And then you can group all of the possible outputs that your generator can make um, in terms of those things and map them onto a two-dimensional or perhaps, I suppose, in-dimensional histogram uh, or heat map, um, kind of showing how where your examples tend to cluster. Um, and then visualize that probably as a 2D uh, space by, by taking those output metrics pairwise and you know, showing it in a, in a diagram like the one on the right here. Um, Something I've wondered just as a side note is kind of whether this idea of thinking about expressive range might be applicable to programming languages as well. Um, there are, there's been some exciting work from Mike Cook again um, on interactive tools for, uh, for doing this kind of expressive range analysis automatically and allowing you in kind of allowing you to interact with that possibility space, selecting examples that show up to see what they look like. Um, but fundamentally, I think that there's a, a kind of a challenge in this space, which is balancing expressive capabil capability and difficulty. Um, the casual creator's ethos very much sort of pushes you to the left side of this graph in which if you are encouraged to, you know, like in, in, if you have a very, very tiny programming language, and I think Mini Cameron probably counts as that, right? Like you have, um, there's only a small number of things that a user has to learn in order to be able to do everything that's possible, and you know, and that's great. Uh, but you know, and then at the at the same time, then you also have examples like um, like tracery or like a you know paint by numbers system. Let's say where I didn't talk about tracery. Ignore that. Uh, like a paint by numbers system in which like yes, the you know the relative difficulty is going to be low, but you also you know if you're following the rules of the system, you can't like just go off and paint anything you want. The whole point is that you're following some rules so that you know that whatever you're doing is going to be within the bounds of some kind of external notion of what qualifies as a good example of an artifact. And as you try to get, as you try to support people who have kind of more expansive definitions of what sorts of things they want to create, um, you need more expressive capability. You need to sort of loosen those constraints a bit. Um, but then you you often wind up with this so-called extensibility cliff where like in order to provide someone with the ability to fully customize whatever they're creating, um, you kind of just like throw your hands up and say, well, all right, you can define your own rules. Or, you know, in mini canner this might be like, well, okay, you can use whatever the host language is um, to define your own things. Um, I don't know if that's a, really a good analogy because, yeah, I don't know, but we can talk about that later. But uh, yeah, I think that this is just like fundamentally a, you know, a tension that anybody who's designing a language or a system for human creativity has to contend with. Um, so yeah, so I kind of wonder like, are there opportunities here potentially um, to, you know, can we think about some of the ideas that we use in domain specific languages and compilers to maybe do something similar for PCG systems where answer set programming is a general framework for authoring PCG, but are there sort of domain specific ideas for different types of things we're trying to generate, like, you know, grids of tiles, for example, where we can uh, uh, dramatically prune that search space and maybe get some optimizations and improve the, the speed of our generator, for example. Um, are there sort of constraints on different things we should be exposing through these interfaces for, say, editing ASP rules? Um, these are the kinds of questions that I've been thinking about lately. So that's it for me. I know I'm a bit over time, but if there is time for questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Yeah, let's let's answer a bunch of questions. I think it's I think it's fine. Cool. This is right. this is a really good talk. Thank you for for coming today. No worries. Thank you. So, so uh, one one thing I, I just remembered, I think you were cut off while describing the idea of no blank canvas. Um, okay. Did you want to elaborate that on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. The no blank canvas principle is um, essentially that like the thing that you're inter interacting with as a creator should have some kind of affordances. Um, so rather than a blank text editor, for example, it's it's like a well established fact in you know teaching computer science to novices that having something like a block-based language where there's a palette and kind of a, a catalog of different um, syntactic constructs that you could put there is really helpful for students who like don't even know what the, like they see that there's a blank text editor and they have a keyboard and they could type any string they wanted to, but like, 
only some, you know, they don't have a mental model for what the what the syntax tree of the language is, right? So similarly, when you're um, uh, in casual creators, if you're trying to create an artifact, like giving someone kind of some scaffolding to say, this is the type of thing you might make. Like it's if it's a table, right? Like it probably has a flat surface and some legs. Like let's start there and kind of give people some prompts to build on rather than just assuming that they know right off the bat um, how they should scaffold their own creation experience. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. So it looks like we already have a question um, from Alexander. I'm going to show it. Cool. So let's see. Yeah. Let me see if Alexander wants to come to the stage and talk oh, yeah. about you, this. You want to say your question aloud? Uh, yeah, sure. So programming language buggers uh, look like you have some similarities in this. Um, when I used one, I got some extremely varied links on the output, and like very, I got sometimes like three, three, uh, I don't know, argument programs, and then sometimes like I don't know, two-page programs. Hmm. Um, is this an output for relational gener or relational generation as well? Yeah, I think I think it is. Um, I mean, particularly if you don't. So I, I think a lot of people. It's interesting because I feel like if you were working in like a level generation space, like one of the most common very first things we do is we define the dimensions of the thing that we are generating. Um, and like we want, we might want some variability on that eventually. But I think typically we're like, okay, first I want to see if it, this thing can generate, you know, four by four grids of tiles say, and just like start with a really small kind of size and then only generate things in that range at first and then slowly grow it to, to have a, a slightly bigger uh, range of possible sizes. Um, so, I mean, maybe that, I don't know if, if approaches like that are similar in program fuzzing, um, but I, I guess, yes, the, I mean, the same problem absolutely can happen if you, if you don't kind of stipulate those constraints up front. All right. Thank you. I would actually assume typically based on the search order of answer set programming, by default, we would get short, like answers that were too short or, you know, shorter than we wanted, uh, rather than longer than we wanted. Anyone else have questions? I, I have a few if nobody else does. Oh, it looks like another question appeared. From Michael Ballantyne. Oops. Hello, you wanna come on stage? I think it's bringing him up. Uh, this software, not happy with their meat. <laughs> I think I see Michael down at the bottom. Oh, okay, good. Finally, he might just be taking a bit. Yeah. Michael, I think I see you, but I don't hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, All right now I hear oh, you. I think I have arrived. Uh, my laptop is struggling with air meat. It sounds like it's lifting off. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I was I was wondering the the privacy policy story example that you gave. To me, it sounds sort of like you might have a language of describing privacy policies, um, and it kind of reminds me of the way we use relational interpreters um, hmm. to be able to interpret a language in a relational way. So I was wondering how you relate those programs to ASP, whether you compile them or you have to manually encode or yeah, interestingly, we don't really have a DSL. Well, yeah, I, I guess we sort of have a DSL in the sense that we're encoding. Um, it, we implemented a planner inside of ASP, uh, specifically a narrative planner. Um, so it kind of has a PDDL like if you're familiar with that at all, like a planning domain definition language. Um, kind of, it has a way of describing actions with preconditions and effects. Um, is is the the short of it, and uh, yeah, and and similarly, actually, in the Gemini project, like we kind of came up with a domain specific language for describing game rules along the similar lines to how Cameron Brown did for the Ludi system, um, and so yes, this like 
idea of sometimes we are writing DSLs within our relational system and uh, trying to then write relational programs over that um, does seem connected perhaps to the idea of relational interpreters, but I don't think I know enough to necessarily say more about that. Um, but yeah, I think we are doing something similar. I guess I was thinking specifically about the bi-directional directionality uh, example you gave of that you could generate user stories from rules, but you could also, for example, audit an action log according to the rules. Um, right, right. And then a third thing it seems like you could do would be to uh, derive a set of rules from a log of actions that were legal or forbidden would be the sort of full interpretive mode of that. Yeah, I think in order to derive the set of rules from the actions, so that, that type of task I would characterize more as being related to inductive logic programming of, of kind of being able to take a set of examples and then generate rules that could have produced those examples. Um, I think, so because we're kind of encoding privacy policies right now directly like as logic programs in ASP or sort of like as constraints over the set of possible stories you can tell, um, we would we don't have a DSL for describing uh, privacy policies, I guess I should say. I see. Okay. Now it makes that sense. part would be a challenge. Yeah. Or we would have to do that a different way. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the question. That's a cool idea. So I have one on uh, touching on what you mentioned about how you need the program to be finite or the, the state to be finite to be yeah. expressible in ASP. Uh, is there a way to tackle unbounded game worlds through through some kind of finite representation that grows maybe or? Yeah, um, encoding infinite data structures is one of my perpetual struggles with ASP uh, because I keep trying to use it to encode like Either you know, like natural languages or or hum or, uh, or programming languages, and you know, and generating expressions in those, and of course, that's like those are infinite data structures, and you know, even just like like lists, right? Like that's a little bit challenging for ASP. Um, there are some encoding techniques, some some sort of tricks to it, um, most of which involve like specifying a bound of uh, up to which you'll search, um, but some of those are really really slow. Uh, and some of them are less slow, and it's like sort of challenging to get, you know, like the the ones that are actually performant are like require rewriting your logic program in a more substantial way. Um, so it can be frustrating sometimes. Thanks. That makes sense. Um, something you mentioned about. Uh, uh, additive versus subtractiveness, uh, and, and then you described how uh, the different types of rules in ASP are either additive or subtractive. Is there also an analogy in terms of the search order of a logic programming language? For instance, uh, forward versus backward chaining, where forward mm -hmm. might be additive and backward chaining would be subtractive. Does that make sense, or is that the wrong way to think about it? I like that analogy. I think um... I definitely think in terms of search order and, and like when I write a logic program, I kind of think about, okay, this feels like it's kind of doing the forward chaining part versus like this feels like it's it's kind of reasoning backwards from an existing possibility space. But I, I mean, fundamentally, it's not doing that uh, because it's all translating it to a uh, Boolean expression and then throwing it to a SAT solver. So it's like kind of, a white lie to like think about um, ASP in those terms, but I kind of do it anyway because that's how I'm used to thinking about logic programs. Um, I do think, yeah, I, I, I think that kind of those those ideas from logic programming do map fairly well into the additive versus, versus subtractive distinction as well. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have questions? Oh, another one just popped up. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, yeah. The tools for exploring possibility spaces seem like they'd also be handy debugging tools for relational programming more generally. Um, yeah, I completely agree with that. I, I would love to have tools like this in all of the logic programming languages. That would be cool. Basically, it comes up because I've been thinking about, you know, when I've thought about tools for trying to debug why, you know, mini Kenron is slow to synthesize something. I sort of want to visualize the space of all of the things that it's considering yeah. in a very similar way. Even, even though you know, there are only partial solutions, I'm like, you're probably wanting to visualize the complete solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if, you, if there are other tools, like, do you know, are there, are there tools out there specifically for program synthesis or, or other applications that try to do similar things? Uh, I don't know of any tools, just just things that I have dreamed of. Okay. <laughs> I have sad I, tools I, that I, I've I written myself. Out more at some point. Sorry, say again? I have sad tools that I've written myself where I, I do printf style debugging of the, the iterative state as it's being constructed and it's it's terrible. I, I would never <laughs> I would never uh, want anyone to use that, but that seems to be the, the best I have available. Well, I, oh, I would love to, to talk to anybody who wants to, you know, if someone if someone would like be willing to share their screen and walk me through a process of like I'm trying, you know, a synthesis problem you're working on where you're trying to figure out how to navigate the possibility space, that could be extremely useful for thinking about the sorts of tools um, to build for this kind of thing. Thanks. Um, oh, I see another question on the screen. Okay, for generate and test, would it be possible to show which lines eliminate the most possibilities? Um, it should be. I mean, I, I think so gen generate and test is kind of a, a broad classification of like several different PCG techniques. Um, so I think it really depends on the technique. But yes, in principle, it does seem like that would be possible and useful. Um, I think about a, a little bit about like, um, it reminds me a bit of decision tree learning um, in which you like try to construct a decision tree where the most differentiating decisions are closer to the root of the tree. Um, yeah, and so since that kind of thing is automatable, it seems like um, maybe something like that would be as well. All right, thank you. All right, I have one more question before we move on. So uh, back when you asked the, uh, the question about, are there two answers or three answers? Um, uh, is that, uh, does that, uh, does answer set programming assume a closed world? Is that the reason why there are only two answers rather than three? Yes, so um, yeah, so the question is, does, does answer set programming assume a closed world? And essentially, yes, because it is doing this uh, preliminary step of grounding out all of your rules, um, it then assumes that that's all, you know, that's all folks, right? Like that's, and the, those are the only things that are possible. Um, the way that you kind of add back in like the, a little bit of the functionality of an open world is with choice rules. You can kind of say this is a thing that like may or may not exist, um, but but aside from those things that you explicitly permit uh, to vary, yeah, it it doesn't um, it doesn't assume an open world. Okay, we have one more from Michael. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Do people use probabilistic programming? Um, yeah. So I know of some people who. We've tried, I think, kind of designing probabilistic programming tools for PCG. Um, I haven't really, I don't believe I've seen any kind of in action or, or any that have been, like, I don't think I've seen people publishing in like games conferences about probabilistic techniques. Um, I would like to, I think it seems promising. Um, I would especially like a tool that would allow you to, and I don't know, I, I think like people mean different things by probabilistic programming, I think, or I think there are several different things that that can mean. Um, but I think like a, a version of that in which you're sort of declaratively describing your, like the probability space that you want to create um, or the probability distribution 
that you want to create and then like sampling from that could be really effective. Um, yeah, because otherwise you're kind of just relying on the, you know, emergent probabilities of the like density of, of uh, examples in your solution space that exist. Sounds like Will should dust off prob Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So um, Chris, if you have more time after, uh, do you want to head to the lounge and answer more questions, maybe? Yeah. So we'll, we'll go to the next talk. Um, right. Maybe Sounds Lisa good. can Thanks, find. Yep. Thank you again, Chris. That was, that was really, that was really good. amazing. I, I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you. is like a